Thank you, Luann, Karen, and Sarah for organizing this event. I'm Christina Hodge, Assistant Director of Collections at the Stanford Archaeology Center. Uh, I'm privileged and benefit from living and working in the Bay Area of California, homelands of Ohlone peoples, and at Stanford University, uh, which is on the ancestral land of the Makma Ohlone tribe. I was a PhD student with Mary from 1998 through 2007. Uh, while studying the colonial Atlantic, I simultaneously worked in repatriation and curricular curation at a global anthropology museum. Despite some meaningful crossovers, I know Mary expected me to emerge from that museum world at some point, and I haven't yet. I feel like the interrogative history and critical representation I do and teach is not so different from using artifacts to investigate everyday life in early modern America. Something compelling carries through from historical archaeology into object-based anthropological curation as we work to tell critical stories and bring to light excluded people in significant new ways. Mary's memorial session prompted me to consider what that something is, and I think it's biography. Uh, in Carolyn White's 2009 edited volume, Mary opened her chapter on Bodkin biographies with a sentence that clarifies how object-centered research operates as a critical biographical praxis. Mary wrote, quote, Here I explore the ways in which close study of a particular artifact type, Bodkins, can be used to understand aspects of personhood and the presentation of self in 17th century English and Dutch colonial contexts, end quote. So presenting Bodkins I Have Known in a volume on personhood is already a telling move. With this deceptively straightforward opening, Mary further entangles people and things by recognizing that objects are foundational to humanistic interpretation and indeed being human. When deconstructed, her opening also makes an excellent methodology slash mad lib. Uh, she began, here I explore the ways. Here sets the interpretive work within a social and temporal context. I explore, self-locates her point of view. We know the work is part of a subjective scholar's own biography. Mary took responsibility, and so should we. By characterizing the work as exploring different ways, Mary acknowledged the open-ended nature of interpretation alongside its multivocality. Uh, next is close study of a particular artifact type, X. Uh, so this is what matters, artifact X. X helps us understand more thoroughly and accurately. In 2009, for Mary, it was Bodkins. Uh, she asks us to choose our thing and pay attention to it. The biographical mechanisms of Mary's close study are nimble and various, combining microbiography and prosopography with other methods. Uh, she traced specific artifacts representing a specialized type of small find via their creation, circulation, and relationships across period and setting. Next, uh, that artifact can be used to understand aspects of why. And this is how Artifact X matters, as a participant in or component of social experience Y. There are endless whys, because every find is defined through its human connections. Personhood and the presentation of self are anthropological questions about the human experience. Mary chose to make the past personal and present. And then in context Z. Uh, in 2009, Mary set a narrow scope in 17th century English and Dutch colonies, but circulations, itineraries, ge genealogies, surrogacies, cycles, events, and non-events, uh, all of these modes of understanding might be construed as biographical uh, frameworks of time and place. Um, they are very diverse uh, opportunities here. Importantly, Mary was also reflexive by including archaeological acquisition in Bodkin's contextual lives. Implicitly, they also encountered her, the Here I Explore, where her methodology began. So, here now is my or our work on how close study of Artifact X can be used to understand aspects of human experience Y in context Z. This simple formulation, of course, belies the alchemy of Mary's interpretive practice. Because of Mary, my approach to anthropological curation is, among other things, an interdisciplinary praxis of objects-based critical biography. The story of Artifact X is never just about Artifact X. A bodkin is never just a bodkin. Object-centered biography carries moral weight because, as Mary wrote with Matthew Cochran in 2006, it, quote, penetrates taken-for-granted aspects of the everyday, 
To pay close attention to things created in the past, we attend to interrelated people in the past, to ourselves, and to work inside, outside, and against inherited knowledge, narratives, and biases. The co-constructions of object and personal biography Mary fashioned over her career inform the ethics of my curatorial practice. Bodrian biographies, including Mary's Bodkin chapter, often concern personal items elevated by their intimacy to hands and bodies, but I emerged from Mary's tutelage convinced that everything can, and maybe should, be treated like a small find, an individuated object with its own life history, enmeshed with the life histories of everyone who encountered it, past, present, and future, including us. Thank you. Hello, I'm Carolyn White. When Christina and Jessica asked me to join this paper, I felt a brief pang of surprise that the volume that I organized and edited was framed as a capsule of Mary's influence. But it is true. The chapters in that volume speak not just to the role that Mary had on each of her students, but on the field more broadly construed. And in a volume that explores individuality and the relationship of the individual to the group, the biography of the book itself illustrates her lasting impact on all of us. As part of, instead of preparing for this paper, I've spent hours looking over correspondence with Mary via email and at comments and notes in her fine point penmanship on copies of papers and dissertation drafts. As all of us who have corresponded with Mary know, in the spaces between the small anecdotes about her daily life and communications could get rather granular. She threw in casual suggestions that like a grain of sand in her favorite mollusk were intended irritants in our minds, pushing us to create something of value. The session at SHA 2006, the first step toward the book, came out of an email conversation with Mary. Out of the blue, she asked me if I was planning on organizing something for the conference. I thought no, and said yes immediately and began to solicit participants, many of them suggested by Mary. Some of the papers in the volume came out of that session, but many were gathered afterwards. When the book began to move forward, Mary suggested a few of her other students for inclusion gathering up her crew and making her influence and now legacy known through the pages of this volume. Now, as I toggle between preparing this paper and my syllabus for one of several material culture based courses that I teach at my university, I've been musing on the contours of Mary's hand on my role as educator and curator of material culture. There is a way that Mary handled artifacts, turning them over in her hands, chattering a bit with whoever was asking her about them, and then in her quiet way, almost trailing off, stating what it was with great confidence. It could be hard to get her to explain her process. She resisted codifying, to me anyway, the subtle differences between shades of green glass. But as her student, I could study the way that she studied things. And I learned so much through many shared hours in the lab and field. Under her supervision, I began to forge my own way of teaching students how to make those same distinctions and classifications. One of the material culture courses that I teach now is a transmogrified form of a seminar that I and many of us took in graduate school. My final project was on combs, marking the beginning of my research on personal adornment. Mary assigned Jules Prown's work, and in one of many through lines, I assigned that same reading to my own students, structuring the course through a Prownian approach to the material world that could just as easily be framed as a Baudrian approach. This process begins with formal analysis that moves to interpretation and then speculation and includes writing about objects in ways that place them in fictitious situations, inspired by Mary's ability to write creatively about objects in a way that activated both object and user. 
Mary handled objects with her words just as deftly and easily as she did with her hands. Her writing is filled with sentence upon sentence that packs together information with atmosphere, handling the specificity of an artifact in a way that conveys its broader meaning. One of the gifts that Mary had was to jump from the technical into the interpretive, to push the interpretation of objects in a way that made sense to use the ideas that she drew from her voracious consumption of as many sources as she could possibly pull together and form an argument. I'd like to close by savoring a single sentence to illustrate her skill. Quote, because bodkins were so personal, indeed often personalized, and because they were used by women and men to present and clothe their bodies by assisting them to lace themselves into their clothing, and because they were normally carried about on the person or even worn by women as part of outward social display as they peeked provocatively out of a woman's head-hugging quaff, they were invested with meanings and with power. It is no accident that so many of us who trace our disciplinary legacy to Mary work with archaeological collections or give primacy to the confluence of the archaeological object and narrative in our work. Mary existed at the intersection of multiple disciplines, showing us the interpretive power of intertextuality while staunchly promoting materiality and the situatedness of context, of things material and particular. As an urban archaeologist of New York City's archaeological repository, I turned to a small triangular mouth crucible excavated from the Seven Hanover block in Lower Manhattan that embodies Mary's theoretical approach to the biographies of people and things. Interrogating the crucible as a small find, it becomes an individuated object with its own trajectory, tied to the life histories of those who encounter it, rendering new subjectivities visible. This is a particularly powerful interpretive approach in urban contexts, where the density and transience of people muddies personal and community narratives. As a critical imperative, the intersection of intertextuality and the situatedness of object narratives requires one to examine extant collections in new ways as knowledge expands and perspectives shift. The life history of the crucible is nuanced, deeply tangled in the social complexities of colonial New York and resists a static functional category. The product of a global economy, the crucible, perfected to withstand extreme temperatures, was shipped to New York from Germany and discarded in a Pearl Street dwelling in 1730. By whom was it used? In what productive process and to what purpose? What individual life did it encounter or household did it support? Whose labor procured and transported the raw materials it rendered or whose labor stoked the fire? What marketplace consumed the finished products and what narratives do these goods express today? It is these micro to macro interrogatories from production to individual and household aspect informed by the nature and situatedness of socio-political complexities, past and present, that comprise Mary's legacy. Research identified the dwelling to be the home and workshop of Huguenot silversmith Simeon Sumain and his wife Mary from 1721 to 1748. Sumain was an accomplished silversmith whose work was commissioned by New York's colonial elite. Today, Sumain's silver is found in leading early American decorative arts collections. His identity and work transform from Huguenot refugee to American silversmith, an arc woven into the historical narrative of the nation's founding. The Sumain family was one of the thousands of Protestant Huguenots expelled from Catholic France between 1680 and 1690. Huguenots dominated the French textile and metalworking industries at their time, and their emigration constituted a techno-diaspora to France. Sumain and his wife had many children, six of whom died in the smallpox epidemic of 1730 and are buried in Trinity Churchyard. Their Anglican burial illustrative of the dynamic nature of colonial identities a Baudry dictum that illuminates the revelatory power of household archaeology to make lives known. 
Of the three apprentices residing at the Sumain residence, two were also Huguenot, including one from Boston, sent by their families to train as silversmiths, highlighting the communal network and shared identity within this religious diasporic community. Tom Sumain's presence in the household, an enslaved black man carrying the name of his enslaver, adds an additional subjectivity to the crucible's interpretation, illustrating, as Mary wrote, that, quote, the narratives we receive vary according to who is negotiating meaning, with whom and under what circumstances, end quote. Tom may have held multiple roles within the household, maintaining the forge, or perhaps as a skilled silversmith, utilizing the crucible in his own work. Records from the 1741 New York slave conspiracy indicate that Tom was tried, convicted, and expelled from the city, a victim of a conspiracy that historians suggest targeted skilled enslaved laborers, lending weight to the contemporary supposition that Tom was versed in the art of silver himself. This brief study of a crucible in colonial household illustrates how we become what Mary called inadvertent biographers, revealing individual and collective experience while expanding our interpretation of the historical moment. I think Mary would have shared the excitement of possessing not the silver Sumain produced, but a crucible critical to the industrial processing of that silver. It serves as a metonym for the complexity of the colonial household of the religious, social, and racial identities that shape daily life, the essential work of a Baudry-trained archaeologist. Thank you, Mary, for the gift of the historical intimacies, your theoretical and archaeological imperatives, gifted those of us who've had the luck of learning from and working with you. We miss you. Thank you.